Welcome to Live from the Grand Teton Music Festival from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Each summer, the Grand Teton Music Festival takes place in the Teton Mountains of Wyoming. Led by Maestro Donald Ronicles, the renowned festival orchestra consists of the world's finest players from more than 90 orchestras around the world. I'm Jeff Counts, general manager of the festival, and I'd like to introduce you to my friend and co-host, music director Donald Ronicles. Thank you, Jeff. Donald violinist James Ennis is one of our favorite guests here at the Grand Teton Music Festival. He's featured on today's program. But before we get to James, we do have a couple of surprises to offer up. We will hear an absolutely bucolic pastoral piece by none other than a young Anton Webern. I bet no one expected me to say that name after pastoral and bucolic. And we'll start off first, though, with a gem of a tone poem by Samuel Coleridge Taylor, the Ballade in A Minor, Opus 33. Donald, it was no less than Edward Elgar who described Samuel Coleridge Taylor as, quote, far and away the cleverest fellow amongst the younger men. Yet his music has had a very hard time breaking out of the fringe for years. And it's hard to see why, because this ballad is such a wonderful, well-written piece. That quote that I mentioned before from Elgar is actually a little bit longer. And the commission for ballad actually came through Elgar's beneficence. I'll read you the full quote now because I think it's interesting. He wrote, I've received a request from the secretary to write a short orchestra thing for the evening concert. I am sorry, I'm too busy to do so. He was about to compose the Enigma Variations. I wish, wish, wish that you would ask Coleridge Taylor to do it. He is far and away the cleverest fellow going amongst the young men. Please don't let your committee throw away the chance of doing a good act. And because of that entreaty, the committee did, in fact, talk to young Coleridge Taylor. I think the good act he was referring to was based upon the fact that Samuel Coleridge Taylor was black and was not getting nearly as many opportunities as he should in that time, or frankly, would have he now. And I think Elgar's generosity in that moment is really quite wonderful. The Ballad is an amazing tone poem on the level of anything that was written in that time. And I find it a tragedy that more people don't know this work. And I was very proud of Christian Reif for bringing it on his program with the Grand Teton Music Festival. Did you know it? Had you done it before I'd, or I'd, even heard I'd it? I'd heard it decades ago, actually, when I was a student in Great Britain. In the spirit of great quotes, I think it's also worth hearing what another great musician, Sir Arthur Sullivan, of Gilbert and Sullivan yes. fame, he attended the premiere and he said the following, quote, much impressed by the lad's genius. He's a composer, not a music maker. The music is fresh and original. His melody and harmony in abundance and his scoring is brilliant and full of color. At times, luscious, rich and sensual. Talk about teeing up a work. Let's see what our listeners think. Guest conductor Christian Reif now mounts the podium here at Walk Festival Hall in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. He'll lead the Grand Teton Music Festival in a performance of The Ballad in A Minor by Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Thank you. 
You've just heard the incredible Ballad in A Minor by Samuel Coleridge Taylor. Guest conductor Christian Reif led the Grand Teton Music Festival Orchestra in a performance at Walk Festival Hall. Jeff, we move on to another surprise by a composer many of us respect and indeed revere. A colleague of mine, Yannick, Yannick Nézé Sequin, who conducts in Philadelphia at the Metropolitan Opera said the following about this piece, quote, the interesting thing is he, the composer, was very proud of this piece and always showed it to his students to say, listen, if you want to go further without the normal sense of tonality and harmony, you have to master tonality. And this was an example of him mastering it before turning 180 degrees different, end of quote. The piece we're talking about is Im Sommerwind, translated as In the summer wind, experiencing the summer wind, written in 1904 by, I wonder if our listeners have guessed, by the 20-year-old Anton Webern. No one would guess that. It's not the music we typically associate with him because he is part of what's called the Second Viennese School, which included Schoenberg and Berg. Let's put that in a little bit of context, though. Why is there a second Viennese school? Well, it's because the first Viennese school is Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven. You could even include Schubert and maybe even Brahms. It was the sort of trunk of the great tree of music history. And from that came this second Viennese school, where pretty much all of the things the first Viennese school perfected were turned on their head and changed forever. This kind of thought, led by Schoenberg and Berg and Webern, dominated much of the 20th century. Webern himself turned away from the kinds of sounds he made in Im Sommerwind very soon after. I do love this piece because of what he said to his students, that you cannot abandon the basics until you've mastered them. I think that is a wonderful lesson for artists of every stripe and every discipline. And I think this music does indeed show a mastery of form, harmony, expression, all of it, doesn't it? It does, and I think in the spirit of what you've just said, no composer at the turn of the century could really move on or find their own voice without absorbing the music of the giants, that is to say, yes, Johannes Brahms, but also, of course, Richard Wagner, Mm -hmm. who was this watershed in musical history. And then in turn, it's Richard Strauss, and then there is Bruckner, and then, of course, there's Gustav Mahler. Gustav Mahler had a huge influence on the young Anton Webern. I think it's this remarkable 
evocation of nature. There's a wonderful quote describing the piece by Timothy Judd. He writes, the Insomovint is an ode to nature. It was inspired by a poem of the same title by Bruno Ville, which extols the rejuvenating properties of green, flower-speckled alpine meadows and refreshing summer breezes. It features six horns, it features two harps, it has a solo violin, it emits trombones and tuba. There is something very akin to the world of Gustav Mahler, specifically in the Fourth Symphony. When I first hit upon the work that the composer himself never heard, it wasn't performed. In some ways, he completely disowned it, and I think it was 1961 that the Philadelphia Orchestra performed it for the very, very first time. I hit upon this piece and just fell in love with it. I was imagining it not from the composer Anton Webern that we know within a short period of time after this was then absolutely shunning tonality and absolutely moving down towards the 12 tone and to some of the shortest classical works in the entire repertoire are written by this remarkable composer. Before all of that, though, we had this. And though the words are not explicit in this music, they're in there. And I'd like to leave you with the last word from the poem this is based on. Peace, peace in the lark song, in the waves of wind, in the waves of grass, unending calm, in heaven's expanse. So now, as the applause builds, here in Walk Festival Hall, Donald Runnicles takes the podium to conduct the Grand Teton Music Festival Orchestra in this performance of Anton Webern's Im Zomavind.
That was Anton Webern's Im Sommerwind. Donald Runnicles conducted the Grand Teton Music Festival Orchestra in Walk Festival Hall, Jackson Hole, Wyoming. You're listening to Live from the Grand Teton Music Festival. I'm Jeff Counts. And I'm Donald Runnicles. Jeff, at the celebration of his 75th birthday in June 1906, the legendary German violinist Josef Joachim said, I quote, The Germans have four violin concertos. The greatest, the most uncompromising, is Beethoven's. The one by Brahms vies with it in seriousness. The richest, the most seductive, was written by Max Bruch. But the most inward, the heart's jewel, is Mendelssohn's. End of quote. Joachim played a very important role in bringing all of these concertos into the fold, and the fact that he describes Bruch's concerto among these four great concertos as the richest and most seductive carries great weight. What do you think makes this concerto work? I've got two answers. One is simple, one requires a little bit of a leap. I'll take the leap with you first. Joachim knew of what he spoke because he helped Bruch bring the second version, the version we know of this concerto to life by giving him tons of advice and suggestions for revisions. So it was really his piece before anyone even heard it. But the piece was written between 1866 and 1868. Brooke often had to disavow people of the notion that it fell out of his head fully formed. He really did struggle with it. And I think that great care is evident in the music. I think you can feel it in this music and it makes it special because of how much he labored over it. There's a couple of quotes that he said about the piece. When he was first beginning, I don't feel sure of my feet on this terrain. He was really uncomfortable with writing the concerto. And then after he got Joachim's help, he admitted to having at least half a dozen different versions of the piece before the final came to be. So I feel that striving, that effort, that commitment to perfection is evident in this music. That's the answer that's a little bit of a stretch. The easy answer for why this piece works, Donald, the second movement. That's the reason everyone comes to this work. The third movement has its Hungarian flavor a la Brahms. The first movement is a fantasy, unique enough formally that he even wondered if it could be included in a concerto, but Joachim told him it's okay. It's really the second movement, though, the jewel at the heart of this piece, this affectionate, generous music that I think brings soloists to it, brings conductors to it, and certainly brings audiences to it. Yeah, I totally agree, and it's also so concise. It's hard to imagine that you're coming to the end of the first movement when you slip into that gorgeous second movement, and it is conceived as a whole. There's no break between the They're movements. played without pause, right? They're played yeah. without pause. For all that material, remarkably short, but just gorgeous, just dreamily gorgeous work, and at the same time is such a vehicle for a great violinist, in this case James Ennis, to show what he's made of in terms of virtuosity. What is he made of? You've played with Jimmy so much now. What does he bring to a piece like this? Or any? Authenticity. Just the physical presence of James makes such an impact on both our audience, but also our players who hold him in the highest regard. Authenticity, simplicity, a remarkable young man with this extension of his spirit, the extension of his soul, the extension of his brilliant musical mind, that is to say, his violin. And James spends almost the entire time almost observing his fingers on the strings, observing his phenomenal, speak to any of our string players, phenomenal bow technique, just how that bow moves so effortlessly over the strings and that silvery sound and when I say authenticity of course we all strive to be authentic, authentic to the music authentic, remaining true to ourselves when you work with James he is such a glorious human being such a collaborator I'm always thrilled when he takes part in chamber music as well, he has his own chamber music festival in Seattle his eyes are wide open. He is always open to new ideas, spontaneous gestures, spontaneous transitions. We don't talk a lot about the music. He turns up and performs. I suppose it's like great friends. You read them more easily. You sense what he wants to do before he even does it. That leads to incredibly satisfying music making with somebody of such a high standard. 
the highest standard. When you say authentic, my mind goes to the word guileless because there's just nothing between him and Brooke and the audience. It literally passes straight through him without comment. It passes through him in a way that's incredibly artistic and gorgeous and technically perfect. I mean, if Brooke wasn't sure where to place his feet, certainly James Ennis is the most sure-footed violinist I've ever heard. He is so technically exacting, but there's just something very generous about the way he presents music to the audience. And I think that's what you mean by authentic. Yes. When I observe James, and he's standing very close to me, obviously, when I observe him and his profound relationship with his instrument, with his violin, I'm reminded of those wonderful videos of Glenn Gould, who, of course, famously sat so low. And you feel that when he's playing Bach, the keyboard is populated by lots of individuals. Those are his fingers, and he's observing them all. It's a little like, as if there's a degree of autonomy. <laughs> you know, these are his fingers. He's observing the music take place and in some ways almost taking delight at the spontaneity of his own fingers. I have that sense with James. It's authentic, it's real, and it's so moving. Gosh, how much repertoire has James played at the Grand Tito Music Festival? Just the very appearance of that young man on stage already leads to rapturous applause simply because the audience has fallen in love with this guy. You'll hear proof of that now as we join James Ennis on stage at Walk Festival Hall with Donald Runnicles and the Grand Teton Music Festival Orchestra. This is a performance of Max Brooks' Violin Concerto No. 1.
That was Max Brooks' Violin Concerto No. 1 in G minor, Opus 26. Dear friend of the Grand Teton Music Festival, violinist James Ennis performed with Donald Runnicles and the Grand Teton Music Festival Orchestra in Walk Festival Hall. This has been a presentation of the Grand Teton Music Festival, located in Jackson Hall, Wyoming. Live from the Grand Teton Music Festival is a co-production of the Grand Teton Music Festival and Classic Digital Syndications. Vic Munzer is our producer. Our recording engineers include Vic and Kevin Harbison. By the way, we would love to hear from you. Write to us. Simply send us an email to listener at gtmf.org. And by all means, come and visit us in the summer in Jackson Hall. For information about the festival, visit gtmf.org. And finally, you can also look for us on our recording label, Reference Recordings. I am Donald Runnicles. And I'm Jeff Counts. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much.